It's really great to be here. And um, what I thought I might do today is, is tell you a little bit about the origins of Gen and Gen Europe and uh, the ups and downs throughout the year, the years, and uh, a few little anecdotes about how things developed along the way. I think um, perhaps the starting point for me would be to go back to 1987 when uh, Hildur and I and a few of our friends in Denmark decided to found uh, Gaia Trust, which is a Danish charity uh, with the objective of supporting uh, the transition to a more spiritual and a more sustainable uh, future. We had no money at the time, <clears throat> but we had a dream and we had a, an, a plan. And the plan, as, as well, Daniel was giving a little bit of a hint of that. I had been working for about five years doing some research on uh, the currency markets and had developed some uh, software which I thought was very promising. And so I, I gifted this, I gave this to uh, Gaia Trust to see what they could do with it. And uh, they went ahead, and, and, and within the next three or four years, suddenly they had uh, earned a few million dollars. And we begin to have, have the problem. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to prioritize Gaia Trust's uh, objectives? And so at that time, back in 1987, uh, we had met uh, Diane and Robert Gilman. I'm sure some of you probably remember them. They had a very similar vision to us. In fact, they, they decided to move to Denmark and would move in to, 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 with us. And we bought a farm on the, the western coast of uh, Denmark uh, and the idea was that we would form a, an eco village with about maybe 10 families, and this would be this would be the, the center of, uh, of Gaia Trust's uh, activities. And um, we were we were all very interested in the, in the concept of intentional communities. And so uh, one of the first things we did was we asked uh, uh, Robert and Diane to do a survey of what was out there, and they came back about six months later with a very interesting report as to what what, what were the major projects which were around the world. And uh, they also made their very famous definition of what an eco-village is. It's been repeated many, many times since then. Um, and the next thing that happened was we, we decided to invite uh, some people to Denmark to discuss this whole question of what should Gaia Trust do with its, its money. And so we invited a number of, of leaders of different eco-villages. I think there's only one person here today who was actually at that meeting. Uh, and that was uh, Albert Bates. Albert, where are you? Yeah, remember? Yeah. And uh, also at that meeting was uh, Declan Kennedy from uh, Lebensgarden in Germany, uh, Max Lindiger from Crystal Waters in Australia, um, Marilyn Mailman was there. She was the uh, head of the Global Action Plan, GAP. And uh, also we invited uh, David Corton, who later wrote this, his famous book, uh, When Corporations Rule the World, and also um, Carl... Here? Okay. Carl Henrik Robert from the Swede, who later developed the, uh, the natural step, he was also there. So we discussed for about three days what should be the priorities of Gaia Trust. And after many, many discussions, we came to some interesting conclusions. One of which was, <clears throat> well, we know what all the problems are. In fact, we know what the solutions are. What we really need is implementation. We don't need to have more conferences. We don't need to write more papers. We have to simply implement what we know. And so we looked around and said, who is actually doing this? <laughs> That's it. So we decided, we decided what we should be doing is supporting the people who are actually out there walking their talk, who are actually doing it, who are actually building these eco-villages and living the way we will all have to live eventually in, in, in a sustainable way. And so that's what we did. Now, the very first project which we supported as a result of that meeting was, in fact, to, to Russia. This, this meeting took place just two weeks after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And one of our participants was my good friend Volodya Shestikov from St. Petersburg. And he was talking about starting, setting up a, a new project called Ecoville. In, in Russia, and so we said, okay, the first project we supported anywhere was Ecoville in Russia. And interestingly, yes, yesterday I was talking to Dmitry, and he was saying, as, as far as he knows, Ecoville has, has survived, it's still going, and not only that, but now there are 400 Ecovillages in Russia. 400, I was amazed to hear that. They must be the country with the most Ecovillages anywhere in the world. So <laughs> that was really interesting news for me. So, 
what happened then was after the next three or four years, we met about 20 of us in different places, and we, we discussed this whole idea of how we would develop this concept. And uh, this led us to uh, meeting at Findhorn in 1995 at the big conference called Eco Villages and Sustainable Communities. Actually, the word eco-village didn't exist when we started talking with Robert and Diane. I think it was pretty much something we, we coined to, to express the, the type of project we were looking for. And this was a very interesting conference. The, the, it was very popular, and Finthorn had to turn away about 150 people. There was such a demand. And another interesting thing about this conference was that there were more men than women. This is very unusual for Finthorn. You know, usually it's about two-thirds women, but for some reason, this particular conference attracted a lot of city planners and architects and so on. And I remember very clearly how a lot of the Finhorn women were, were going around saying, oh, what a fantastic energy in this conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and also I'd like to tell you a little anecdote about how, how Jen got its logo. Because on, on the final day of this conference on, uh, at Universal Hall, on Friday morning, I was presenting sort of the results of our discussions during the week and how we were going to found this Global eco -Village Network the next day. And um, in, in discussing the Global eco -Village Network, I, I used this analogy of, of the, the caterpillar, metaphors in, morphing into a, a butterfly. I, you, we've heard this story many times since then, I'm sure, about how these so-called imaginal cells appear in, in the cocoon of the, uh, of the ad caterpillar, and gradually they begin to synchronize their vibrations until such a point when they begin to form a network, and this network becomes the foundation of the butterfly. Just as I was saying, guy, uh, rather the global eagle leech network could become the foundation of a of a new culture uh, eventually. And just at that time, a butterfly landed on my overhead projector. You know, this, uh, this is before the days of PowerPoint. <laughs> and so there it was, this butterfly landing on my projector, and everybody started giggling around the hall. And uh, one of the ladies came up and gently took a hold of it and let it, let it out the door. But the thing was that people were saying, you never see butterflies in Finhorn in October. And so we took this as a very positive omen that somehow we were on the right track. And I think that was a very positive omen. And so the next day we actually founded the GEN, the Global Equal Age Network. <coughs> the next big event was about, uh, in the next year, in 1996, the UN had a conference in Istanbul, Habitat 2. And... Um, Jen was there for the first time publicly, and we, we had a tremendous impact because there were about 20 people, from all, volunteers from all over the world, mostly from Europe. And by the way, let me just say that Jen Europe has always been the backbone of Jen. I mean, there always have been greater activities here, more members. Uh, it, it was in the early days, we, you know, we, we formed regions, the three major regions, one uh, here in Europe, under, under the leadership of Declan Kennedy, one in the Americas under the leadership of uh, Albert Bates, and one in Oceania, Asia, under the leadership of Max Lindeger. But it was here in Europe that we very quickly had about 20 national networks going, uh, far more members than the other regions. And uh, Albert did a great job in, in the Americas getting nine regions established, both in North and South America, but it was much more difficult in, in Asia because of the great distances and the, the larger countries and so forth. But at this conference, uh, we had a big presence, and uh, one of the reasons was that Declan Kennedy, who used to be a professional dancer in his younger days, uh, offered circle dancing every afternoon at 3 o'clock, and we attracted a lot of people, even from the official conference there. And I remember um, Mattia, uh, Bangari Mattia, who later won the Nobel Prize, uh, was there every day. She said, this is the place I feel most at home, she said. <laughs> And so that was a great. And in fact, the official conference actually invited us uh, to make a presentation at, their, at the official conference, which we did. <clears throat> and we put forward a proposal that, that the United Nations should put aside $100 million to build 50 eco-villages across the world in different uh, climate areas, in different cultures, different geographical zones to, to, make a, to, to demonstrate what the future could look like. And we were very disappointed when they came back to us and said, that's a very nice idea, but we have no money. <laughs> 
So we were more or less left to our own resources. And this is very typical of the development of, of the eco village movement. We have got very, very little support from, from any kind of uh, government bodies. So over the next few years, the Gen Board began to meet in very different, many different countries. <clears throat> and Hildur and I at that time were sort of non-voting members, and so we traveled around with the Gen Board. Uh, we were in many countries, I remember we, were, we went to Lebensgarten in Germany, we were at Torre Superiore in Italy, we were at Huawei Coyotl in Mexico, we went to Wangasit Ashram in Thailand, we were in Sri Lanka, in St. Petersburg, Zeg, and probably a couple of places I can't even remember. Uh, one, one little story I do remember though is when we were at Torre Superiore, I think it was in 1998, uh, after the Gen uh, Board conference, we, uh, or rather just a Gen Board meeting, uh, we had a tour of some of the Italian eco-villages. And uh, the conversation got around to, well, what, what, are, the, what are the Italians going to call the, their, their network? And, and somebody said, well, we're thinking of calling it uh, Gen Italia. And I said, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> so fortunately, they, they, they changed it to Riva, which is it's still, it's still the name today. And another story about those trips, you know, this is, this is one on Albert, you know. Uh, in 1999, you remember we were approaching the millennium, and there was a lot of talk about... The, the, what was going to happen in the computer world when, when, we, when we switched from 99 to 00. zero. You know, a lot of people were saying the whole country is going to collapse. You know, and people were starting to, to stock up on canned foods and preparing for the worst. And Albert, he was convinced that he was not going to take any chances of flying anywhere on New Year's Eve. And so we were in Sri Lanka at the time, and he made sure that he, he left in good time to get home before New Year's. Right, Albert? <laughs> well... <clears throat> As we all know, it, nothing much happened. Uh, but Albert, in the meantime, had written this book uh, warning about all the dangers, uh, and his mother, who was a cook, had writ written part of the book as well, talking about how you could use uh, making delicious food out of uh, uh, canned food, which was, everybody was stocking up on in America. So six months later, I ran into Albert, and I thought I'd make a little, have a little fun with him, and I said, well, Albert, how's it going with the book? <laughs> And he said, fantastic, fantastic. I said, how come? He said, we said, well, he says, my, my mother's recipes for this canned food are just selling like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yesterday we heard a lot of, from Daniel about good news and bad news. And so following that theme, I have to mention that in around 2003, we had some bad news. And that was that... By this time, I had sold off this company. The guy I trusted sold off the, 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 the company which was operating in the currency markets. And so we had no really further income. <clears throat> I didn't want to stay in that market. I, was, I decided to be there for 10 years, and then I was going to get out of it and do what I really wanted to do, which was really supporting the, the transition. So we had to cut back. We had to cut back on the funding because we couldn't keep it up at that the level. And the next few years were very, very difficult for Jen. Uh, fortunately, in Gen Europe, there were some other sources of income that came along. Uh, the German foreign ministry was, was very good, and EU gave some funding. But basically, it was a period uh, which was very difficult for the whole uh, Gen, especially in, in, in the uh, non-European parts. But then uh, something happened later, later on. <clears throat> in 2015, we had some good news. And that was the following, that back in 1995, <clears throat> I had invested some of my personal money and some of Gaia Trust's money in a uh, Danish company called Urtekram, which was the largest um, organic foods wholesaler in Scandinavia. And it was pretty much almost bankrupt when I went in. And 50, 20 years later, it was a thriving company and profitable company, and we sold it. And this meant that Gaia Trust suddenly had a few million dollars to do something with. And so we were able to go to, <clears throat> to Kasha and to May East, uh, Gaia Education, and, and say, we're going to be able to double your budget from now on. And so we did that. And suddenly, you know, a new life came into both organizations uh, as we now could begin to hire some, some better professional staff and so forth. So that was the, that was the good news. <clears throat> 
By the way, I didn't mention a lot about guy education, but in, in 2005, uh, we met again at Finthorn, just jumping back. <clears throat> and uh, that project of, of launching guy education was one of Hildur's uh, great ideas. We, all, all the way back in 1998, uh, we had called a meeting of people from around the world, 50 people who came to, to Denmark to, to, to talk about how we could form an education across the regions. That was always Hildur's dream. And so by, 19, by 2005, we had actually launched uh, Guy Education. And also at that same meeting in Finhorn again, we launched uh, Next Gen for the first time. So, uh, so getting it, I was a little bit going backwards for a minute, but now going forward again to 2015. <clears throat> this is also a sad event for all of us, and me personally, though, when Hildur passed away in September of 2015. But she left behind a, um, a last wish. You see, back in 10 years earlier, we had started publishing what we called the four keys in Dot Guy Education. Four different books, one for each of the dimensions. The social dimension, which Kasha was an uh, editor on, by the way. The economic dimension, which I see Jonathan Dawson and myself and Helen and Orbert Hodge were the editors. Uh, one on ecology and one on worldview. Hilda's great dream was that to have a fifth key, which was, she thought there was too little design in the, in the four keys, and we'd like to see a, des, a fifth key based on design. And so that's what we did. And here it is. It just came out. It's called Eco Villages Around the World. Subtitle. 20, rege 20 Regenerative Designs for Sustainable Communities. And this was the, the fifth book of the, uh, of the four keys, the fifth key. And incidentally, when Hildur passed away, she left behind a list of the eco, eco she thought should be included in that uh, design book. And uh, most of them are actually included. I'll just, I'll just mention some of them, uh, the 20 communities. Uh, Solheimer in Iceland. Vindhorn in Scotland, Oroville, India, Damanhur in Italy, Sekem, Egypt, Svanholm in Denmark, Huawei Coyotl in Mexico, Chayu de Mapie in Brazil, pardon my pronunciation, Kibbutz Lotan from Israel, Torre Superiore in Italy, Eco Village at Ithaca in the USA, Lila Oru in Estonia, Tamira in Portugal, Sieben Linden in Germany, Chololo in Tanzania, Narara, Australia, Hurdal in Norway, Tasman Eco Village, Australia, Huateo in China, and Permatopia in Denmark. Now this book, this book is now on sale at the local shop for 20 euros, and uh, I would encourage you to to buy it, take it back to your eco-villages. And in fact, if your eco-villages are interested, I'm sure Guy Education can give you a good discount so you can actually earn a little bit of money by selling it in, in your regions. And I hope that many of you will take up the uh, opportunity. So just to round off now, I just round off with a, with, with a, uh, a thought, you know. Back in 1991, I said to my fellow partners from the other countries and from Denmark in particular, that what we were embarking upon was really not only subversive, but it was a 40-year project. This was a long-term project. We were really trying to, to change society. So we should not expect quick results. But 40 years is a long time. We're only partway there. We still have a few years to go. And folks, I believe that the tide of history is on our side. I'm quite optimistic that we're going to make it. Thanks very much. <laughs>